from Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the Cube covering KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Europe 2018. Brought to you by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to the live CUBE coverage here in Copenhagen, Denmark for KubeCon 2018, Kubernetes um, European Conference. This is the CUBE, I'm John Furrier, my co-host Lauren Cooney, We're here with Adrian Cockcroft, who's the Vice President of Cloud Architecture and Strategy for Amazon Web Services, AWS. CUBE alumni, great to see you, legend in the industry, great to have you on board today. Yeah. Thanks yep. for coming on. Thanks very much. Um, quick update, um, Amazon, we were at uh, uh, AWS Summit recently, mm -hmm. obviously reInvent last year, again, gets bigger and bigger. Just continued growth, congratulations on successful, great earnings mm -hmm. um, you guys posted last week. Yep. Just continuing to show the scale and leverage that the cloud has. So again, nothing really new here. Cloud mm -hmm. is winning and the model of choice. Um, so you guys are doing a great job, so congratulations. Open source, you're handling a lot of that now. This community here is all about driving cloud standards. Yep. You guys, position on that is standards are great. Yep. You do what customers want, as Andy Jassy always says. What's the update? I mean, what's new since Austin last year? Yeah, well, it's been great to be back on. Had a, a great video of us talking at Austin. It's been very helpful to get the message out of what we're doing in containers and what the open source team that I lead has been, been up to. It's been very nice. Um, since then, we've done quite a lot. We were talking about doing things then, which we've now actually done and delivered on. Uh, we're getting closer to getting our, our Kubernetes service out, EKS. Uh, we hired uh, Bob Wise. Uh, in, he started with us in January. He's the general manager of EKS. Some of you may know Bob. He's been working with Kubernetes since the early days. Mm -hmm. He was on the CNCF board um, sort of before, yeah, before he joined us. So he's working very hard. They have a team cranking away on all the things we need to, to do to get the EKS service out. So that's been major focus, just get it out. Um, we have a lot of people signed up for the preview, uh, huge interest. We're onboarding a lot of people every week and um, you know, we're getting good feedback from people. And we have demos of it in, in the booth here this week. So you guys are very customer centric, um, you know, following you guys closely, as you know. Um, what are the, what's the feedback that you're hearing and what are you guys ingesting from an uh, intelligence standpoint from the field? Obviously a new constituent, not a new, but like a, a major mm -hmm. constituent is open source communities as mm -hmm. well as paying enterprise customers. What are, what's the feedback, what are you hearing? Um, obviously beyond tire kicking, there's a general interest in what Kubernetes has, has enabled. What's Amazon's view of that? Yeah, well, open source in general is, is always getting a larger uh, slice of, of what people want to do. Uh, generally, people are trying to get off of uh, their enterprise solutions onto, and evolving into an open source space, and then uh, you kind of evolve from that into buying it as a service. So that's kind of the evolution from on-prem um, custom or enterprise software to open source to as a service. And uh, we're standing up all of these tools as, open, uh, as a service to make them easy to consume for people. Just everybody's happy to do that. What I'm hearing from customers is that they, that's, that's what they're looking for. Um, they want it to be easy to use, they want it to scale, they want it to be reliable and work, and that's what we're good at doing. And then they want to track the latest um, moves in the industry and run with the latest technologies, and that's what Kubernetes and the CNCF is doing, gathering together a lot of technologies, building a big community around it, just able to move faster than we'd move on our own. And we're leveraging all of those things into what we're doing. And the status of EKS right now is in preview? Yep. Any estimated timetable for GA? In the next few months. Next few months, okay. Yeah. We'll you know, get it out, then, you know, Right now it's running uh, in Oregon, in, in our Oregon data center, so the previews are all happening there. So that gets us kind of our initial thing, and then everyone go, okay, we'll want it in our other region, <laughs> so we have to do that. Um, so another service we have is Fargate, which is uh, basically you say just, here's a container, I want to run it. You don't have to declare a node or an instance to run it first. We launched that at reInvent. Uh, that's already in production, obviously. We just rolled that out to four regions, so that's in, Virginia, Oregon, Dublin, and Ohio right now. And a huge interest in Fargate. It kind of get, lets you simplify your, your deployments a little bit. 
And uh, we just posted a, a new blog post that we have an open source blog. You can find if you want to keep up with what's going on with the open source team at AWS. So we just did a post this morning and we talk, it's a first pass at getting Fargate to work with Kubernetes using a virtual kubelet, which is a, a project that was kicked off by, it's an experimental project, it's not part of the core Kubernetes system, mm -hmm. uh, but it's running on the side, it's something that Microsoft came up with a little while ago. So we now have sort of, we're working with them, uh, we did a pull request, they accepted it, so that team and AWS and a few other customers and other people in the community working together to provide you a way to start up Fargate as the underlying layer for provisioning uh, containers underneath uh, Kubernetes as the API for doing you know, the yeah. management of that. So who do you work with mostly when you're working in open source? So what, who, who do you partner with? Who do you, you know, what communities are you engaging with in particular? Uh, it's all over. All over? I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, wherever the communities are, we, we're engaging with them. Okay, any particular ones that stand out as? Well, other than CNCF, we're, we have a lot of engagement with the uh, sort of the Apache Hadoop ecosystem, a lot of work in data science. There's many, many projects in that space. In um, AI and machine learning, we've sponsored the, we spend a lot of time working with Apache MXNet, but we're also working a lot with TensorFlow and PyTorch and Cafe, and there's the, those are all open source frameworks, so there's right. lots of contributions there. Uh, in the serverless arena, um, we have uh, our own uh, SAM, serverless application um, model. We've op been open sourcing more of that recently ourselves and we're working with various other That's great. You know, people and so So there's, you know, across these different groups, there's different conferences you go to, there's different things we do. We just sponsored um, Rails Conference. My, my team sponsors and manages most of the open source conference events we go to now. So we just did RailConf. Yeah. We're doing a Rust conference soon, I think, with Python conferences. Uh, yeah. I forget when all these others, there's a massive calendar of conferences that we're supporting. Well, make sure you e email us the, that list we're interested yeah. obviously, in, um, in looking at the, what the news and yeah. action is. So, so the language ones, OzCon's our flagship one, will be a uh, top level sponsor there. Um, and the, um, we'll be, when we get to the US KubeCon in, in Seattle, it's right there. It's two weeks after reInvent. It's yeah. going to be much easier to manage. So one <laughs> week after reInvent was like, everyone just wants to take that week yeah, off, yeah. right? We got a week for everyone to recover, yeah. and then it's in the hometown. You still had so that look in your eyes, and when we interviewed you in Austin, you came down. We both were pretty exhausted yeah. after reInvent. Yeah, we're, so we announced a bunch of things on Wednesday and Thursday, and I had to turn it into a keynote by Tuesday and get everyone to agree that's what was going on. It was That was very compressed. So we have more time, and all, all of the engineering teams that really want to be at an event like yeah. this, we're, uh, we're right in the hometown for a lot What's of What's it them. like we're in Amazon? I mean, got to ask you, since you brought it up, I mean, and you guys run hard at Amazon, mm -hmm. you're releasing stuff at the pace that's, you know, unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I get blown away every year. Almost yeah. seems like inhuman that, that you guys can, can run at that pace, and earnings, obviously, or business results speak for themselves. Um, what's it like there? I mean, uh, if they put your running shoes on, you run a marathon every day, yeah. what's it like? It's lots of small teams working relatively independently and that scales. And that's something other engineering organizations have trouble with. They, they build hierarchies that slow down. And we have a, a really good engineering culture where every time you start a new team, it's, it runs at its own speed. And um, we've shown that as we add more and more resources, more teams, they are just executing. In fact, they're accelerating, so they're building on top of other things. Yeah. Right, we get to build higher and higher level abstractions uh, to, to layer into. Just getting easier and easier to build things. So we're, we're accelerating our pace of innovation. There's no slowing down. I always tell Andy Jackson they're going to write a Harvard Business uh, School case study on mm -hmm. a lot of the management practice, but certainly the impact on the business side yep. uh, with the model and you guys doing. But I got to ask you on the momentum side, super impressed with SageMaker. I mean, mm -hmm. I predicted on theCUBE and um, yep. AWS Summit that that will be the fastest growing service. It will overtake Aurora. I think that is the currently is on stage presented yep. as the fastest growing service. SageMaker is really popular. Updates there, uh, its role in the community. Obviously, Kubernetes is a good fit for orchestrating things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we heard about uh, Kubeflow, um, is an interesting model. What's going yeah. on with SageMaker? How is it inter I interplaying think, with Kubernetes? I think people that want to run, if you're running on-premise cluster of GPU-enabled machines, then Kubeflow is a great way of doing that. You're on TensorFlow, that manages your cluster. You're on Kubeflow on top. Um, 
SageMaker is running at very large scale, and like a lot of the things we do at AWS, you know, what you need to run an individual cluster for a one customer is different from running a multi-tenant service. So SageMaker sits on top of ECS, and it's now one of the largest you know, generators of traffic to ECS, which is Amazon's sort of horizontally scaled sort of yeah. multi-tenant cluster management system, which is now doing hundreds of millions of container launches a week. So that isn't continuing to grow. We see Kubernetes as it's a more portable abstraction. It has some more you know, different layers of APIs and a big community around it. But for the heavy lifting of running tens of thousands of containers and for a single application, we're still at the level where ECS does that every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and Kubernetes, that's kind of the extreme case where a few people are pushing it. So it'll, it'll gradually grow scale. So there's evolution. But, every so there's an evolution here, yeah. but yeah. The, the interesting things are we're starting to get some convergence on some of the interfaces, like the, the interfacing of CNI. Uh, CNI is the way you do networking on containers, and there is one way of doing that that is shared by everybody through CNI. EKS uses it, ECS uses it, and Kubernetes uses it, you can, you know. And the so impact of customers the is what for that? What's the impact? I mean, so if you, the networking structures you want to set up will be the same, and the capabilities and the interfaces. But what happens on AWS is because it has a direct plug-in, you can hook it up to our accelerated networking infrastructure. So at the AWS its instances right now, we've offloaded most of the network traffic processing. You're running 25 gigabits of traffic that's quite a lot of work, even for a, a big CPU, but it's handled by the, uh, um, the Nitro plugin architecture we have um, this in our latest instance type. So we've talked a bit about that at reInvent, but what you're getting is an almost complete hypervisor offload at the core machine level. So you get to use that accelerated networking, right? You're plugging into that interface, but that if you want to have a huge number of containers on a machine and you're not really trying to drive very high throughput, then you can use Calico and we support that as well. So, sort of multiple different ways, but all through the same, the you basic, the same plugins on, on both. So there's just, so some portability there. So what, you mentioned some stats. What's the numbers you mentioned? How many containers you're launching a week? Hundreds of thousands? What's the ballpark? Uh, on, on ECS, the, our, our you know, container platform that's been out for a few years, so hundreds of millions a week. It's really growing very fast. I mean, containers are taking yeah. off everywhere. Yep. Microservices growth is, yep. um, again, that's the architecture. As architecture is a big part of the conversation, what's your dialogue with customers? Because the modern software architecture in cloud looks a lot different than what it was mm -hmm. in the three layered approach that used to be the web stack. Yeah, and I think yeah. to add to that, you know, we were just talking to folks about how in large enterprise organizations you're still finding groups that do waterfall development. Yeah. And, and how are you working to kind of bring these customers and these developers into the future per se? Yeah, that's actually I spend about half my time managing the open source team and recruiting. Uh, the other half is talking to customers about this topic. I spend my time traveling around the world talking at summits and events like this and meeting with customers. And there's, yeah, there's lots of different problems slowing people down. I think you, you see um, three phases of adoption of cloud in general. One is just speed. I want to get something done quickly. I have a business need, I want to do it. I want machines in minutes instead of months, right? And that speeds everything up so you get something done quickly. The second phase is where you're starting to do stuff at scale and that's where you need cloud native you really need to have elastic services. You need to scale down as well as up, otherwise you just end up with a lot of idle machines that cost you too much and it's not giving you the flexibility. And the third phase we're getting into is complete data center shutdown. Like you, if you look at creating, investing in a new data center or a data center refresh, or just opening an AWS account, it really doesn't make sense nowadays. And we're seeing lots of large enterprises either considering it or well into it. Some are, some are a long way into this. And when you shut down the data center, all of the back-end core infrastructure starts coming out. So we're starting to see sort of mainframe replacement and the really critical business systems being replaced. So those are the interesting conversations. That's one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in right now. And it's leading into this other buzzword, if you like, called chaos engineering, which yeah. is sort of the, think of it as the availability model for cloud native and microservices. Um, and we're just starting a working group at CNCF around uh, chaos engineering's being started this week. So we can get a bit involved in how we can build some standard and patterns that's be at for Stanford? doing that. Where's that going to be? 
It's here. I mean, it's a it's a working group. Okay, mm -hmm. online. So okay. CNCF working group. They are wherever the people are, right? Yep. So what is that conversation? When you talk about that mainframe kind of conversation or shut down data centers to the cloud, what is the key thing that you promote up front that needs to get done by the by the customer? I mean, what are the? I mean, now you have the pillars, mm -hmm. the key pillars. Yep. But you know, you think about microservice. It's a global platform. It's not a lift and shift uh, situation. It kind of is a shutdown, but I mean, not at that scale. But security, identity, these are authentication. There's per, no perimeter, so yep. microservices are potentially going to scale. What are the things that you promote up front that they have to do up front? What are the upfront uh, table stake well, decisions? For management level, the real problem is people problems, and it's a technology problem somewhere down in the weeds, really. If you don't get the people structures right, then you'll spend forever going through these migrations. Um, so if you sort of bite the bullet and do the reorganization that's needed first, and get the right people in the right place, so then you move much faster through it. So I say a lot of the time, yeah, I, I am, we're way upstream of picking a technology. It's much more about get understanding the sort of DevOps, Agile, and the organizational structures for these more cellular-based organizations. You know, AWS is a great example, Amazon's a great example of that. Um, Netflix is another good example of that. And there are lots, uh, Capital One is becoming a good example of that too in banking. They're going much faster because they've already gone through that. So they're, the, they're taking the Amazon model, small yeah. teams. They have is that your general recommendation? Teams. What's your it, general recommendation? Well, this is the whole point of microservices is that they're built by these small teams. So they, if you build, the, it, it's called Conway's Law, which says that the code will end up looking like the team, struct, the org structure that built it. So if you set up a lots of small teams, you will end up with microservices. That's just the way it works, right? If you try to take your existing siloed architecture with your long waterfall things, your, it's very hard not to build a monolith. So getting the org structure up done first is right. And then we get into kind of the landing zone thing. You could spend years just debating what your architecture should be, and some people have, and then every year they come back and it's changing faster than they can decide what to do. Right, so that's another kind of like analysis paralysis mode you see some some large enterprises in. The others are just saying, just do it. Like, what's the standard best practice? Lay out my accounts like this, my networks like this, my structures, we call it landing zone. We get somebody up to speed incredibly quickly and it's the beaten path. We're starting to build automation around these onboarding things for just getting stuff going. That's great. Yeah, and then Going back to the sort of chaos engineering kind of idea, one of the first things I should think you should put into this infrastructure is the disaster recovery automation. Because if that gets there before the apps do, then the apps learn to live with the chaos monkeys and things like yeah. that. And really one of the first apps we installed at Netflix was Chaos Monkey. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't added later, yeah. it, was one, it was there when you arrived. Your app had to survive the, the chaos that was in the system. So think of that as, it used to be disaster recovery was incredibly, expensive, hard to build, custom, and very difficult to test. People very rarely run through yeah. their disaster recovery testing data center failover. But if you build it in on day one, you can build it automated. Yeah. And I think Kubernetes is particularly interesting because the APIs to do that automation are there. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at automating, injecting failure at the Kubernetes level, and also injecting into the underlying machines that are running Kubernetes, like attacking the control plane to make sure that the control plane recovery works. So I think there's a lot we can do there to automate it and make it into a low cost, productized, safe, reliable thing that you do a lot, yeah. rather than being something that everyone's scared of doing that. You know, or they bolt recovery. it on after they make decisions and yeah. retrofit pre-existing conditions into a disaster recovery. Yeah which is chaotic in and of itself. So let's get the org chart right, and then actually get the disaster recovery patterns. If you need something highly available, do that first, before the apps turn up. That's Great, it. Adrian, thanks for coming on. Chaos Engineering, congratulations, and again, we know you know a little bit about Netflix, you, you know that environment, and Ben, big Amazon customer. Sure. Uh, congratulations on your success. Looking forward to keeping in touch. Thanks for coming on, sharing the AWS sure. perspective Thank on theCUBE. I'm John Ford, Lauren Cooney, live in Denmark for KubeCon 2018, part of the CNC at the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. We'll be back with more live coverage. Stay with us, we'll be right back.